Medic. Yeah. What do you um, as far as expanding kind of kind of care? What do you, what do you think about the whole EMS like Pocus, the point of care ultrasound, and if you like, I I have it written here. If you had to pick between the pre hospital blood administration and the Pocus, what do you think? Like, which one would you pick? More bang for your buck, and what can I do with with what, what which can do more for me? Um, yeah, that's a really tough question. So I think it depends on what environment you're in. I think that pre-hospital, you know, point of care ultrasound is going to be absolutely crucial for prolonged field care, for austere medicine. Um, and that has to go right alongside with whole blood administration. I don't think if you, if I had to pick one in that specific environment, I don't know that I could pick one. Um, I think What's going to be absolutely crucial civilian pre-hospital is whole blood. If I, I recently had, and, and this was coming, a patient that got transferred from a rural area, and these guys just did the very best they, ca- they had with limited resources. So absolutely not a criticism at all, but um, sent me a, a young patient, high-speed MVC ejected, had a prolonged um, time prior to getting to me at KU, and by the time she had gotten to me, she had gotten five liters of crystalloid. Now that has that has now entirely diluted out and replaced her entire blood volume basically with crystalloid. So she did not do well, and it was a good learning moment for all of us. And like I said, not a criticism. These guys did the best they could, but we absolutely have to be able to change the way that we care for rural pre-hospital trauma. And I think the biggest bang for the buck is going to be whole blood Um, and or getting these guys access to, if we can't get whole blood, um, appropriate component therapy with a one to one to one ratio. Um, We we can't do that to people anymore. Not in this day and age, not with what we know with the evidence base. We just can't do that anymore. I would take it. I personally would have taken a patient with a systolic of 80, maybe with a whiff of some levofed or some presser running. I would rather that then have her get all that crystalloid. Right, and wash um, out. She, now she's acidic, she's cold, you washed out all her clotting factors, you know, we're not, <laughs> you're past the point of helping, which... Well, and now and now her superimposed hyperchloremic yeah. metabolic acidosis right. is, is is compounding on top of her lactic acidosis from right. trauma. And and again, if, so, we, if you, even if you can get her out of the trauma bay, out of the ED, out of surgery, she's got so much that's probably going to go wrong in that you know, in the unit, uh, as far as trying to correct all that metabolic derangement. And, you know, we, we're doing, uh, we're doing pre-hospital trauma life support right now for our graduates as part of a prep toward their registry exam. And that's, that was yesterday, the physiology, the, my favorite lecture in that again, canned course, but my favorite lecture, the physiology of life and life and death. Um, so they, they get all that horrible, you know, um, lactic acidosis talk and, all the all the metabolic terrain, the shifts and everything, and it hurts their brain. But when they come out of it, the whole point of it is is you guys got to do more to set your patient up for success long term. It's not just wash your hands of them at the hospital, dump them off. So, I'm glad to hear you say the whole blood, um, because again, you know the fancy. I think Pocus is very fancy, and uh, I think it's got merit. But I feel like I'm left without you know that that gratification. Like I can put the probe on. And I can find the blood in your belly, but then I got to look at the patient and go, I'll take you to the trauma center uh, where my friend and surgeon, uh, Dr. Yergi, can help you because I don't have blood on the truck. And she's got it all. But I'm going to bring you there. Uh, and people are like, well, you know, at least you knew. I'm like, well, they're going to know that when they fast them, when they hit the tape, when they hit the bed. It's not a big deal. It's like doing a 12 lead and going, yep, you're having a STEMI and going, well, I don't have aspirin. I don't have nitro. Um, and, uh, well, I... I'm not even going to call and let them let them know to get a calf table ready. I'm just we'll just let them know when we get there. I feel like I can't do anything about it. So now I know you can do a lot more with EMS Pocus, but just I think that's the most important one. I'm glad to hear that blood administration. So I, I mean I think it's a good it's a good uh, it's a good cause to fight for in the future. So yeah, and it, it's the biggest chasm right now between pre-hospital and in-hospital because you guys only have by and large civilian EMS systems only have SOPs and they're only stocking crystalloid of some kind. There are exceptions to that. There's guys that have freeze dried. There's guys that have, you know, fresh thawed 
um, plasma and there's guys that have PRBCs and there's maybe one or two, maybe, well, maybe three or four agencies that have um, whole blood, mostly the flight guys, the flight paramedics. But I think that's the biggest divide between common practice and what we do in the hospital is still so vastly different from what is able to be done. And again, this is not the fault of any of the, the ground medics. It's just the way that the medical direction, the med protocols and, and the logistics have, have kind of played out. Um, and I, I do think it's gonna get there. Um, I think that POCUS is gonna be a big deal, particularly for prolonged field care, for medics who have SOPs and, and a med box that is just much more diverse than what you guys all have access to on the civilian side. So for instance, those guys needle a chest once or twice and the patient still has respiratory distress. Well, you throw the butterfly on their chest, see if you can't figure out if that's chemothorax, in which case the patient needs a finger thoracostomy, or if it's a, a pneumothorax and maybe you're just not hitting the pleural space with your needles. Um, and same thing for patients who have abdominal pelvic trauma. So are they bleeding retroperitoneal into the pelvis, in which case you're not gonna see it on the fast, because the treatment for that is to bind the pelvis and resuscitate the patient. Or are they bleeding into their belly, free bleeding into their belly, in which case there's a couple of different options. One of them is Reboa, one of them is the foam that Dave King out of Boston is working on um, in, in conjunction with aggressive resuscitation. So I think for, for medics who have access to a higher level skill set and they have access to different sets of meds and different protocols, I think POCUS is going to be crucial alongside whole blood. But for us in our environment that we work in, I think whole blood has to be the number one kind of push for all of us. Because again, it's the biggest divide between what the evidence base tells us that we need to do for a bleeding patient versus what you guys all have access to, you know, currently with your SOPs and, and what you're stocking. Absolutely. Um, so what you're kind of to kind of go back to that a little bit when you say about, you know, looking at where we should get to, how about right now? Like, what do you think that the civilian pre-hospital providers really need to be focusing on in the realm of trauma care today? Like bef before we get to the, the pre-hospital blood, whole blood. Yeah. I, I think that we still have a long way to go with um, training our colleagues on good hemorrhage control techniques I think that there's a lot of civilian EMS and, and fire EMS systems that have brought on tourniquets, but don't really understand all of the ins and outs of tourniquets. I always joke with my students, like I could give a six hour lecture on hemorrhage control. And so I, I don't know that we delve deep enough into that and really have a good understanding of how to obtain good hemorrhage control. I think that's, that's probably one piece of it. Um, I think kind of the understanding of Unfortunately, particularly recently, I've run into a lot of cookbook medics and guys who just don't really understand the physiology of shock or under kind of come at things from a framework of well, what's the safest thing for the patient. Um, so, for instance, I came across a, a fire medic who is absolutely doggedly convinced that a patient with a traumatic amputation, like legit, the upper extremity was gone sitting on a table 10 feet away from him, gone. And this guy was trying to argue with me that that didn't need a tourniquet. Now, and his justification was because his protocol said so. And I, I just was like, goodness gracious, sugar plum. That just to me, you know, bless your heart, because that just to me reflects the fact that you do not understand the physiology of trauma, of vasospasm, of the fact that you get this guy's systolic up above 90 um, without a tourniquet on there and you get him warmed up in the back of your ambulance, he, his brachial artery is going to open right back up. And, and in this day and age, there is not an excuse with how safe we have. We've got tourniquets that are evidence-based that have very, very low profile for side effects. Um, and there's just no excuse for that patient to lose one more drop of blood out of that arm. Um, there really isn't. So, I think that's another part of the battle to answer your question that kind of we continue to have to focus on is really helping folks understand good hemorrhage control, but also understanding the physiology of trauma. Because I don't, 
I don't want medics who are going to be um, chained to a protocol. I want medics who can look at that and say, well, from the 10,000 foot perspective, this young man is, a, is awake and alert and mentating only because his entire body just shot off a ton of adrenaline and fight or flight hormones. And he's already had a major hemorrhage once. And even though he's young, he is not going to tolerate a second episode of major hemorrhage. And so I'm going to kind of let my protocols go and I'm going to put a tourniquet on this because that's the safest thing for this patient to make sure he doesn't lose anymore. So some of that is, you know, old mindset and, and being cookbooky or kind of protocol driven. And I don't get me wrong. I do not take for granted the fact that as a trauma surgeon, I, you know, sit in a glass palace and I have the luxury of not necessarily having to be chained to protocols. And I, I very, very, am very respectful of, you know, the audience to whom I am, I'm speaking, but I, I guess I would just encourage folks to ask for the evidence and really dig in intellectually and understand why your protocol says what it says and just ask for yourself. Is there evidence for that? Um, what does the evidence tell you? Because I think those are the best medics that I've ever worked with are the guys who really dig in and think and make sure that they understand it backwards and forwards. Because there's a time that where, and I've seen this a million times, where the best thing for the patient is to throw your protocol on, in the garbage and use your clinical judgment and do what's the safest thing based on the evidence. And I hate to say that. I know that's probably a controversial thing to say, but... Um, those are the best fire EMS medics that I've worked with, um, the best you know, civilian EMS medics that I've worked with, and the best flight paramedics that I've worked with are the guys who are really good critical thinkers. Um, so I, mean, I think one of your questions for later on was, what would I, if I had one thing to, to encourage for, for um, civilian pre-hospital, that would be it. No, that's it. That's absolutely what I asked. Um, you know, and I think you're you're absolutely right between the cookbook medics and the and the clinical thinkers and the critical thinkers. You know, we we really push that. Ask for the evidence. Become a critical thinker. Lifelong learning. Um, don't just settle for your protocols. And I think a lot. I think a lot of that stems from people don't understand that your protocols, your standing orders in a in a civilian pre hospital service, whether it's flight or whatever. You know, there that's not meant for every patient. That's meant for your initial patient contact and patient presentation. After that, you need to be thinking. I mean, you need to be going, okay, did that work? Did it not work? Did my patient change? Do I need to change? What else do I have available to me? Um, you know, and then you, you know, you see those people when you're, you know, like, hey, I'm, hey, hand me this. And they're like, oh, that's not on the, that's not on page 33 of CHF. I'm like, yeah, well, yeah, but this guy didn't read page 33 and uh, he's in cardiogenic shock now. So, Let's go ahead and put the push dose pressers and uh, call the doc because we need to mix an epi drip because we have a 25 minute transport time. And they're like, we don't do epi drips. I'm like, that's why I said call the doc. Pay attention. If you call and you tell them, this is what I have, this is what I've done, this is what I want to do, here's how I think it's going to benefit, you do the legwork. The doc goes, wow, that guy sounds squared away. Yeah, go ahead. Put, put, a, put a milligram in 250 and do what you got to do. You know, and it's like, okay, awesome. Or, you know, mix a, mix a milligram in 1,000. Do what you got to do. And it's like, okay, great. And this is, and if you can, the other problem with the, the, the cookbook and the protocol based people who don't move past a certain page, they can't articulate why they made that decision. And, you know, then, you know, they start to stutter and they get a little louder and they say, well, the protocol says, and then the training officer says, well, they followed the protocol. So they didn't really do anything wrong. You know, the patient's in cardiogenic shock still. So it's kind of, and they knew how to fix it, but weren't a hundred percent sure. So they didn't get, it didn't get fixed. So, you know, I, I absolutely see where you're coming from with that in, in all aspects of it. So, well, great. Um, so what, uh, I, I think I know the answer, but it's probably the whole blood, but what's, what is really the one, what's one thing that's really exciting you in trauma care today, whether it's civilian side or, or, or other. Oh man, that is, that's kind of a tough question. The whole blood part is super exciting. And I, I think that's kind of a, a bread and butter staple that needs to be the first priority, but there's so much cool, sexy stuff going on in trauma right now. Um, Pre-hospital Reboa um, in, in austere and or, you know, over in Europe, um, 
I think Raboa has a lot of potential and is going to be something, but, but I also am excited to see what these guys can come up with as far as junctional tourniquets um, and stuff like the AAJT that would maybe prevent us from having to do an invasive procedure to get hemorrhage control for thoracoabdominal trauma. Um, uh, I think all the, all the different, the different facets and kind of the complexity that's coming out now with trauma resuscitation, um, the, the critical role of calcium. In fact, my, my good friend, Ricky Ditz is one of the combat medics who's really pushing as opposed to the lethal, um, triad, you know, cold coagulopathic acidotic, um, pushing it as a lethal diamond, which I think is going to be the next evolution, um, to include the fact that these patients get hypocalcemic and that in and of itself portends a, a pretty significant mortality. Um, and so if it's someone who's bleeding, um, kind of going ahead at the front end and giving a gram of calcium, um, because you know, as you give them blood products, they're going to get hypocalcemic and you're just going to make that worse as you resuscitate them. Well, let's just go ahead and give the calcium. Um, and that's, there's a bunch of young combat medics, who are, who are kind of doing all that research as we speak. I think that's going to be really cool to see that come into play. Um, I mean, and then like the different surgical interventions. So when I was training, rib cleaning wasn't really a big thing. Um, there's a bunch of data coming out now, and this is kind of just for me for, for fun in the hospital. It's one of my favorite surgeries is doing rib platings. Um, and that data set continues to evolve. So the, the answer to your question is there is so much um, cool, sexy stuff. I mean, trauma is always sexy. That's why everybody likes it. But <laughs> there's a bunch of really awesome innovation going on. Um, and that's why I love this field. Uh, well, one of many reasons, but so. Awesome. Tell people uh, who aren't as high speed as you and I what uh, Rabella is. Oh, sorry. Um resuscitative endovascular balloon occlusion of the aorta. They just made it into a really cool uh, set of initials. But essentially, it's a, it's a technique that's been used historically um, in vascular surgery, um, where you go in through the femoral artery and you uh, s slide essentially a wire or catheter up into the, the thoracic or the abdominal aorta, and you blow up a balloon to basically shut down the aorta so that wherever the patient is bleeding downstream from where the balloon is, there, there's no longer blood going past there. So you can essentially just shut down the pipeline. Um, it's a, a very heavily debated, um, tons of active research going on about doing Reboa both pre-hospital but also in trauma centers. Um, and that's what makes it so exciting right now. There's just a ton of, of good information that's coming um, to the forefront about how, when, why um, we should be using Reboa um, and putting together some good protocols and CPGs. So the Reboa is exciting me too um, on the austere side and the military side. And I saw uh, Major Fisher doing one of the first civilian workshops. And I know yeah. you're going to do a workshop at SOMA. Right. I am. So, yes. So um, Andy Fisher, who is one of the groundbreakers with this, has a Raptor course, R-A-P-T-O-R, -R, um, down in Texas that he's running with his colleagues um, to teach both physicians and then pre-hospital folks how to do Reboa. Um, this year at SOMSA um, in May will be the first year, I think, that we will be running um, a, a full Reboa lab prior to the conference. Um, and that's myself and some uh, an Italian uh, ER doc and an Italian soft medic who are putting that together. Um, so we are we are dutifully spreading the gospel um, of Reboa, even even as it is in evolution and, and respecting the fact that we don't have all the details worked out yet with the data. But um, I think it's going to be really exciting to see how that stuff plays out. And I'm just really excited to be a part of it. Even though it's invasive, I saw it as, and again, it's anecdotal and it's just me thinking, you know, out loud. I saw that, or I see it as a better, a better intervention than the junctional tourniquets. Um, only, I mean, I have limited practice with them. 
And I know a lot of people jump on that AAJT. I'm not a fan. Um, you know, first gen failures, and then you know, uh, there's some data coming out of the second gen ones, and I get it. And uh, just again, simplistic street medic knuckle dragging thinking. If you can get a balloon above the bleed, inflate it, and stop the bleed internally, I don't need to. I don't need to depend on an external piece of medical equipment that you know yeah i have to have a ton of training to do raboa and again i'm the, i'm very intimidated i don't think i again knee jerk knee jerk knuckle dragging street troll reaction no place in civilian ems oh my god i don't want a lot of my friends having scalpels and doing things like that but again i i doubt i doubt it, we're doing that tomorrow um you know i'd kill for finger thoracostomy locally uh, i i I I understand the evidence and I understand the training and I think it would be great, but I, I think there's so much merit in the Raboa in plenty of situations and I would love to see it work and I would love to see that move forward so fast with the data and all the evidence. Um, it's I agree with you 100%. It's exciting. Um, and again, it's kind of like doing surgery in the field and it's sexy and it's exciting. Um, do I think it's outside of the realm of civilian EMS? No. I just don't think everybody's going to be learning that in paramedic school tomorrow. So, but I would, I can't wait to see where it goes. So, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm on board. I'm with you a hundred percent. I think if, and when Reboa comes to civilian pre-hospital, it needs to be flight paramedics and it needs to be um, rural ER. I, I don't know that there's a role for, the routine kind of street medic who works in either a rural or an urban environment. I don't think that that's where the indication is going to be. I don't know that they can necessarily do it safely. I don't think that civilian EMS systems are going to want to financially support that no. and logistically support that. Um, so I, I think it's going to, I think it will come to the civilian side in a very narrow focused kind of finely tuned set of limit with limitations. Um, and, and with a ton of training, because again, that's, that's the problem with us trying to do it on the civilian side, you know, in, in a rural critical access hospital, that's a pretty significant skill set that has to be maintained. How are they going to keep their numbers up? So I think there's a lot of logistics that need to be worked out. And, and I do not think that at any point in the near future, that will ever be, because the reason that it came to, to European pre-hospital is because they have a whole different set of personnel and training that are on their their helicopters right. and that different are in the animal. pre-hospital setting. Yeah. France France has physicians that deploy into pre-hospital. Okay, that's different. They just have a, a resource base that is more supportive of pre-hospital Reboa than we do, I think. Right, and then a lot of people see the pictures of the pre-hospital ECMO in uh in france and places like that and in london they're like oh i'm like wait wait that's a doctor that's a doctor doing that yeah. <laughs> the, the paramedic is the guy holding the sheet up so people can't see what they're doing it's he's not making any cuts he might have helped with the drape calm down <laughs> he's there yeah. to he's there to make sure cpr is going well that's about it and then, again not downplaying not downplaying the scope of care for medics and that we can't you know wrap our bird brains around it i'm Again, I'm a realist. You know, we're arguing about do we need an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree right now, so or a degree at all. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's years off, but again, I think it's very exciting to me. It's very exciting to see where it's headed and where it's coming from. So, um, okay, we'll do. Let's move into the let's move into the lightning round, and we'll wrap all this up for today. Because I think we could probably do two more episodes. I feel like I need to go to medical school to keep up with you. <laughs> um. So what was, was it, can you think of something that you weren't prepared for as a new doctor or a surgeon? Um, I don't think I was prepared for the emotional toll. And, and I don't think I was prepared for, you can do absolutely everything 100% correct and, and as fast as is humanly possible and patients will still die on you. And, and I think when we're training people, when we're training medical students and residents and we're training, you know, fire EMS guys and paramedics and ALS and BLS, I think that has to be, I think mass casualties need to be included. And I think that you're going to have a, you're going to have a, a simulated patient where you have done everything correctly and you got all the right answers and they're still going to die. And you have to be able to 
have enough emotional resilience to be humbled and learn from that, but to also just accept that there are forces in the universe that have more control than we do. That was the part that I wasn't ready for. I always thought if I was the best student, if I got all the right, the answers right, well, they live, right? Um, and that's just, that is the unfortunate reality of what we do um, is that we live, we live on the, on the, on the cusp, on the, on the outskirts of life and death every day. And, and that is a gut check moment. I think when you fight the good fight and you lose, do you have what it takes to ante up again? Um, those have been the moments in my career where I've had to, God, do I really want to do this job? <laughs> um, so that was the part that I, nobody ever told me that. I didn't know that that was a very, very real experience for anybody who does what we do. It's hard to teach that. Hard to teach that. I struggle with that too. Or te- yeah. passing it on to the, passing it on to the paramedic student. So, so um, what, how about, uh, what was the, what's the best career advice you've ever got? Um, the only thing that you should ever be focused on is what's in the patient's best interest. You know, as in training, um, well, he said, or she said, or this attending was being a jerk, or, well, the nurses won't let me do X, or, you know, you get into all of these side digressions and side conversations about politics or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I I called one of my friends at my first job who was a neurosurgeon, and I said, Lou, I don't think this patient needs to be in the ICU because it's a really tiny, tiny head bleed, and you know, we don't have any ICU beds and I can't staff this with my nursing staff and blah, blah, blah. And he stopped me mid sentence and said, Yergi, what is the safest thing for this patient? And I said, the answer is the safest thing is to make an ICU bed and that's where they belong. And so, and and same exact thing goes for all of the pre-hospital environment. You guys get hit from so many different angles with, with a lot of politics and a lot of ego and a lot of shenanigans. Um, and as long as you stay grounded and humble and you're a constant learner, but most importantly, stay focused on self-care and patient care. Um, and if you do those things, you're always going to be right, um, even when somebody else is giving you a hard time for it. That is fantastic advice right there. I'm going to turn that into a quote for uh, for social media when I get the episode done. That's awesome. Oh, dude, he, he stopped me <laughs> mid-tracks. It was like late at night, and I was ranting and raving about all the hospital politics and how there wasn't a bed. And he he's a good friend, a dear family friend. And he's like, Yergi, I need you to stop talking. <laughs> what is the safest? And it was one of those aha moments. I was like, shit, that's exactly the right answer. Right. And that should always be the right answer right. is forget that's everything nice. else. What is safest for this patient? And that's what I'm here for. That's what I should be yeah. doing. Right. It's weird. It's weird how quick you lose sight of it because of all that outside extraneous shit. <laughs> that's oh, weird. absolutely. Weird. Well, and it's everywhere and it's every it day. It is everywhere. There's always, always, always going to be some distraction. Right, right, right. So I guess that might go along with the next question. Like what piece of advice would you have for that first day EMT or medic on their first shift? Kind of, kind of the same, kind of along the same lines, right? Yeah, I would. Yes, absolutely. I also would say um, the one thing that I've had to start doing is as I'm in the car driving to my shift, I put on some really good kind of amp me up music stuff that's upbeat and gets me going. And I kind of whatever it is, a mantra or pray to the trauma gods or whatever it is that gets you focused and centered and and ready to play ball. Um, Because what you guys do and what I do that stuff gets real dicey some days and there's chaos and there's patients, you know, that have bad, bad problems and you got to be able to think on your feet. And so for me, it's, it's good music. It's a prayer to the gods of trauma to be, to be kind to me and my patients today, whatever it is that works for you to get you centered so that you have your game face on and you're ready to go. Um, and, and there's no way that you can walk into your shift, um, on the ambulance and be the very best provider that you can be if you are hungover or exhausted or emotionally distressed. And so the the importance of self-care in in making you the best medical provider you can be, I just don't think that that can be overstated. 
incredibly important. Absolutely. So. Absolutely. Especially in this day and age, man. Um, so you kind of started digging a hole there when you're talking about music. You kind of hit some pre-shift ritual question I had, too. So, all right, I get it. Music, mantra, pray to the trauma god. Um, there was something you sent me, and it wasn't it, – it, oddly enough, it doesn't show up on the uh, uh, the KU Medical Center uh, bio from you. And <laughs> it says, uh, in the OR, that you like to listen to gangster rap. And oh I, man! And I find yeah. that really weird that a lot of medical people, <laughs> I think, and again, I'm, I would never go down that road. I think you and I are close in the same age. I think you're probably a little younger than me. But um, I, again, you grew up California, then to the Midwest. And you're talking gangster rap as a pre-shift ritual in the OR while you're fishing around in people's innards. So, being California native, I would assume. Your big West Coast rap fan. What do you? What are we listening to in the OR? Oh, you betcha. So, I mean, I was I was an eighty ba an eighties baby, and I am like the whitest white girl, like middle class nerd, super nerd. And so people always think that's hilarious, but it's so true. So the music that I grew up listening to in uh, in Southern California in the eighties, you know, well eighties and nineties really, um, was Snoop, Dre, Ice Cube. Um, all of like when, when gangster rap, like really became a thing and became kind of a pop culture phenomena. Oh my God. I can, I know every single lyric to Snoop Dogg doggy style. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And it's hilarious. Cause I am the nerdiest, you know, middle-aged white girl on the planet. Um, but no, anything. And that's, and that's mostly by the way, for like scheduled cases when, when the room, when the operating room is already chaotic and we're desperately trying to save somebody, there's no music on. But if, if I'm in there taking out a hot gallbladder with my residents, um, I expect them to know that Queen Latifah was a rapper before she was an actor. I expect them to know the lyrics to um, Dre's album, The Chronic. I mean, if you don't know those things, you need to get out of my OR because we just got to educate the next generation, man. That's, like, these are important, that's, critical facts. I really think, and I, I think I present company excluded myself, I think the more gangster rap that the uh, nerdy white kids, middle-aged white kids listen to, I think that's why we're where we are today in the positions we are today. <laughs> and uh, when I guess it's it's easily within the last six months, the meme came out, um, Jerry from uh, Rick and Morty driving to work, and it says – uh, yes. <laughs> driving to work, listening to songs about dr dealing drugs and killing people on my way to my job where I save people's lives and shit like that. And like 15 people send it to me. They're like, this is you. I'm like, yeah, it is. Absolutely. <laughs> Duh. I'm listening. I'll send them a picture of like satellite radio right now or whatever's playing through my phone. And, you know, it'll it'll be it'll be biggie uh, again. I'm I'm an East Coast kid. So, I mean, I can't but I mean, uh, I'm not a, I'm not the world's biggest Tupac fan, but I can move from I can move from hit him up to, uh, you know, biggies, you know, juicy or uh, give me the loot easily with no problem. Beastie Boys, you know, BDP, yeah. KRS one, you know, you uh, earlier episode um, uh, uh, Aaron Dix was on. We were talking that he was talking about uh, his role in a nursing home fire. Um, where he came from, and and we talked. About, I think we spent a good ten minutes just on uh, old school '80s rap beefs, and you know that's just again nerdy nerdy white kids. Um, <laughs> so that's good. It's good. To, it's good. To, I, I I can't believe that's not on your bio for uh, uh, the medical center. So uh, no, I know. Right? I'll, I'll I'll put an you email. Should, you should hear what the ortho guys listen to. Those guys are listening to like death metal, like dirt dirt dirt, like. They get really hardcore in the ortho. Or. Well, and that was also a weird thing. I I, I was going to go that route when you were talking about how you pick trauma critical care and acute surgery, because you know you said, "Oh, team sports." I was athletic. I'm like, "Well, why are you not an orthopod like the the jock meatheads of surgery? Come on." So. Oh man, you know I thought long and hard about that. <laughs> I, I love those guys have all the cool toys, right. all those screws and hammers and nails and plates. Man, I feel like some days when I'm plating ribs, I kind of feel like I miss my calling. Right. But it just, you know, for me, like I like I've mentioned, it just wasn't enough. I wanted to be able to have a broader focus. Um, so yeah, but I do love it. I do love plating ribs because I get to I get to live out my inner orthopod. There you go. That's that. See, I I kind of thought that, but I didn't want to put words in your mouth. But I'm glad you said it. So that's awesome. Yeah. So what? Uh... What's next? What's next for Dr. Yergi? Anything? Anything you want to say before we wrap it up? I find a weird, awkward way to say goodbye. 
Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just want to keep, I mean, I'm, I'm going to be at KU as long as they'll have me. This is, has been the very best thing for my career. I adore my partners, our staff, our trauma team is it's so strong and, and amazing. Um, as long as they'll have me, I'll, I'll be here. Um, and I, I want to keep doing as much pre-hospital outreach education as I can. Cause I, I really, you know, you guys always say, Oh, I'm just a medic, but, um, Working with pre-hospital civilians and, and fire EMS um, and first responders, God, that just lights my fire. And so as long as I can do that in my career as my kind of side passion project, I think I'll be okay. Um, and yeah, this Reboa thing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dig deep and I'm going to keep doing the tactical medicine and keep going to SOMA and putting my head down and learning from the best of the best. Um, nothing, nothing big, nothing crazy. Um, but, but hopefully nothing but good things as long as, as long as folks will, will have me, um, and are, and are willing to keep inviting me out to speak and work with them and teach, um, I'll do that stuff forever. So. Awesome. Awesome. I'm absolutely, like I said, I'm going to try and make, I think I really can only make one day of SOMSA this year. I've been trying to make it for years and I think this year might be it. We'll try and I'm going to really try and make it that Wednesday or Thursday. I really wish they would put out the uh the schedule the speaker schedule to see what i'm what i'm gonna get into up there but i'd love to be able to be up there for some of those workshops but nope not this year so oh hell yeah no that's awesome those those guys are just the best of the best and they they just love sharing their knowledge and it's just so cool i learn just a ton every year when i go cool well i probably drag dietrich with me or the skinny medic as you know him and we'll track you down and say hello to <laughs> All of our heroes, the Paul Luces and Major yeah. Fisher and all those guys, and be like, "Sign my tourniquet. You're my hero." <laughs> I know, right? I do the same thing. I fangirl out. In right. Front of those guys. Be like, I'm just going to talk to you for a second, if I'm allowed to, and then I'll just move on because I'm not worthy, street medic. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, good deal. Well, listen, I appreciate you coming on to sit down, talk to me. Um, I don't know. Let's see. I'm going to look at the old recorder. An hour and 20 minutes we've been talking, so this will end up just two or three episodes, so you'll be famous three times over. Yikes. Yeah, That's right? Terrifying. Right, right, right. And then we'll do another episode about the other stuff that we couldn't talk about. That'd be awesome. I'm always up for that. I can... <laughs> as awesome. long as I'm anonymous, I can be fairly politically incorrect and pretty, pretty honest about my opinions about some of that stuff. I'll get better at post-production, and we'll change your voice. So, oh, no, yes. so no one will know. So. <laughs> that would be excellent. We'll, we'll make it happen. Well, great. Do Dr. Yergi, I appreciate you coming on. Thanks for your time. Thanks for all the stuff you're doing out there. And thanks for backing up the paramedics and the EMTs out there, too. Oh, man, always, always. I will be your guys' fiercest advocate. But, yeah, hey, thank you so much for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Absolutely.